right. So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's I Dodger Live. It's Thursday. It must be visits with Thomas. Welcome to another Thursday, uh, and we're still at it. It's a year later. We started I Dodger Live literally over a year now, some time ago. Um, but it's so much fun. And I get to visit with so many different people all, every week. Some I know well, some I know less well, some I don't know at all. But we all know each other, including you, uh, at the end of this program. And today we have a really wonderful program. It's this whole month of Tuesdays and Thursdays with Thomas, Tuesdays being the song thing, as you know, and Thursdays being more general conversations about music and, and major personalities. Um, Wednesday, this, this, this month, May, we're concentrating on um, a, 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 a series of, of concerts I put together with the El Harmony with my foundation uh, under the, under the, the what do I want to say in, in what language, under the umbrella of Song of America, a celebration of Black music. Um, and the idea came out of, of, of last summer and fall when there was such a demonstrative sympathy, especially in the European countries, for the issues of Black Lives Matter. And in fact, even for a while, this program was sort of being called Black Music Matters, but we we stopped that because it, we're not a, this isn't a political program and we don't, I'm not aligned with, and it would be presumptuous of me to, 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 to tag on to the Black Lives Matters, which is an incredibly important movement. But Germany, especially was extremely interested about what is this about? And so I called up Christoph Lieben, who runs the Elbfer Harmony, and I said, wouldn't it be great to play the music this is all about? Why don't we just, can we just listen to the canon of creativity and the classical medium from African-American composers, probably the most ignored canon of repertoire in the world today? Uh, we're gaining on it, but it's, 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 it has been like a parallel universe of creativity in our culture in America for decades. And thankfully, we're starting to break break through that. Uh, but in in my humble way, uh, with my passion for song, I wanted to do some concerts, really showing people how beautiful, how meaningful, how appropriate for today's world all of this literature is and all of these songs from where they come in our American culture. And yes, it is all African American composers and African American poets, but they're American composers and American composers. Langston Hughes is my poet as much as anybody else's poet. And the stories that man tells is stories of human life. And yes, through some pretty, well, fascinating prism, prisms, if you will, some of them pretty tough to listen to and accept, but that isn't that the whole point of identifying and empathy? Isn't that one of the great things that music and the world of music and poetry can do for us as a society, aware us of one another so that we understand each other better? I think so. That's where this program is coming from, and that's what May is all about. And this interview are three wonderful protagonists. The young man in the corner, well, maybe not your corner, I don't know what your screen looks like, but Justin Austin is actually a young baritone, and I've known him for a couple of years, and I invited him to be part of this project. And of course, Justin brought me repertoire I'd never heard of, and a, one composer anyway I had never met. And I must say, Sean, I'm sorry, I didn't know who you were. I, try, I apologize. I. I I'm, I'm going to be, I'm doing this and saying this because I want people who are watching this program and who will watch this wonderful series that, uh, at the end of May, beginning of June, people are, are a little bit, well, I don't know anything about that. I don't know any of these composers. I don't know these names. I've never heard this music. That's the good news. That's the really exciting news. And I want to be totally upfront uh, that, that some of this has been a, a world of exploration uh, if not excavation for me as well. But Sean, please, please tell me your name so I don't say it wrong. Uh, Sean Opebolo. Sean Opebolo. And I keep wanting to put that K in there. I'm going to leave that alone for a minute. And a, a man who I do know quite a bit about, uh, one, we're both up at Manhattan School of Music, but Damien is, Damien Sneed is, is one of the most, for, one of the most foremost composers in our country, blazing directions in all possible directions. And Damien, I have to say earlier, when you said you were doing a concert, I should have interrupted and said, okay, were you singing, playing, tap dancing, composing, conducting? Uh, you know, what do you mean doing a, doing a concert? You sure as hell weren't just visiting, I'm sure. Anyway, Damien Sneed, welcome. 
Thank you so much for having me. This is a great uh, cadre of musicians and rising stars that I'm here with. You're, you are a star. Uh, Justin Star, I believe, is rising maybe by tomorrow morning. <laughs> and Sean Pueblos as well. I'm just glad to be in the number, as we say down south. Well, ah, that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful phrase. Yeah, you are. We're going to talk about your experience. Yes, at my age, I'm just glad when I get to rise every day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm good to go. You know, it's OK. Uh, and yes, I think you're absolutely right. I think Justin is. Uh, well, well, we'll get into that. Justin is not here by accident. I believe in this guy and half from the moment I heard him sing. So welcome. Welcome all three of what I'd like to do is one, talk less, and I'm sure people will be happy about that. I'd love it if each one of you could kind of give your own Wikipedia. I'd love for people to on our, on our show and in our classic orbit to know where you came from. Where did your musical stuff start to appear? Did you want to do something else with your life? Where did you go to school? Was there an epiphanal moment? You know, was there a flash of light? You're, you're in the road to Damascus or whatever crazy metaphor you want. How did it happen? Who wants to go first? Let's split up the conductors. Sean, you're on first. Do you mind? No, I don't, I don't mind. Um, we'll, go, we'll go Sean, Justin, and Damien. So I, I guess I mean, we all have interesting stories, but um, uh, my father is a Nigerian immigrant. He came over here, um, uh, met my mom, had my twin sister um, and me. Um, he soon, though, mm -hmm. um, uh, left and went back to Africa. And so... Um, it was just my my mother and my sisters. Uh, 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 you know, she was raising us. I have a great relationship with my father. That's a whole nother story. Um, but we pretty much grew up poor in Kentucky in the projects. Um, in Kentucky. In Kentucky, my mom worked several jobs. Um, so around the age of seven, six or seven, the Salvation Army church bus came to our community and it would pick the kids up to to do this boys and girl scout type program um and you know maybe six months later we started going to the cyber Army church which has a very strong tradition um one of the strongest in the denomination so long and short of it um is i got free music lessons at the cyber Army. that was my music education fantastic yeah, and so from I mean I had these world class compo uh, uh, performers and composers in my congregation, and one in particular, James Kerno, who's one of the uh, most famous um, composers of educational concert music. Um, um, he taught me composition at, at around age, um, age age fourteen, and I, and and so I had a really good uh, music education um, through the generous through the generosity of so many people who really took their time just to teach me. Me, me music. I had this gift, and um, and they and they saw that. Um, from then, um, I, I how did how did the gift how did the gift show up first? Piano, well, singing, instruments, melodies, thinking. You know, oh, it's a great question. Um, you know, the first when I was six or seven years old, they gave me a baritone horn, and we sang in the choir. And um, uh, but I've always loved creating. So I remember when I was, this is a true story, I was uh, around 13 or 14. Um, I wrote this little hymn arrangement for baritone horn and, and piano. Uh, um, Be still for the presence of the Lord. I still remember it. Um, and then afterwards, uh, Jim Crono comes to me and he's a euphonium player. He said, you know, you're sounding great on your, on your instrument. I love the arrangement that you did. And how about I, I start giving you private uh, euphonium lessons. So I said, sure. So anytime he was in town, he was very international. He would give me lessons. And after like the third lesson, I said, you know, Mr. Kerno, I thank you so much for, for giving me uh, lessons on the baritone horn. But I'd rather you teach me composition. And he said, I'd rather do that anyway. And so, uh, wow. and so we did that. So I went on to uh, college and um, a small college in Kentucky, and then I went to where I continued to study with Jim Kerno, and then I went to Cincinnati Conservatory and did my master's in, in, in doctorate. But it's really interesting. At the end of my doctorate, I, I, I said to myself, you know, I'm, you know, I'm strictly classical, contemporary classical, the whole nine yards, right? I said to myself, you know, I'm at the point where I really want to, you know, uh, you know, engage the music of my mother and engage the music of my father. So the music of mm -hmm. my father 
took me to Nigeria and and studying the Ishin tribe, you know, um, and I've been there several times and studied, I, I've done a lot of work in the Africa, East Africa and West Africa. Um, and so that's a whole nother musical journey that I, I kind of went on. But also the music of my mother, who's an uh, African-American, that came, that's, that, that's you know, you know, you know, um, um, a Negro slave song, you know, uh, you know, the, uh, the spiritual. Gospel. So that's Gospel. what I, Right, 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 and so and so I had this spiritual, uh, you know, uh, Af a ego spiritual route, and then the music of uh, of Africa, and so that began to inform a lot of my uh, uh, um, music, um, and the and the rest is rest is history. Where do you live now? Uh, outside of Chicago, I'm a professor of composition at uh, Wheaton College Conservatory of Music, and so I have a studio here and. Um, teach some theory on the mainly composition and I just compose and, and teach. You, you know, I was going to say, you might, I hope your, your teaching load is decent because you're, you're composing so much work now. I know. And, and, and that's a thing. I actually, I've actually, um, I'm on a sabbatical next year and, and, and I'm reducing some of my teaching because I'm, I'm doing a lot of writing. Um, also have a beautiful uh, family, a wife and two kids. And, and so, you know, fantastic. I, I to, you know, you, you know, it, you know, time is not my friend. So, uh, and, and <laughs> oh, time's everybody's friend. You better make friends with it, because <laughs> he'll, he'll, time will take it all and walk away from you. Anyway, we're going to circle back to your compositions and talk about that. But that's a great, that's a great lead-in. Justin, you're on. Where are you from? Hi. What's all that? I know some of this story, but it doesn't matter what I know. Who <laughs> are you? Well, I, I'm Justin Austin. Um, I am originally from uh, Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, my, both of my parents are opera singers, are retired opera singers now. Um, but my father uh, was fest for a very long time at the Stuttgart you know, Opera, uh, Staatsoper. And um, that is why I was born there. Uh, I uh, went to school there, kindergarten, first grade. Um, and my mother at the time was also, um, um, a traveling, working, international opera singer. And she came, one year she came to, to see me. Um, and I, she had been gone so long, I didn't know who she was really. Um, and yeah. I barely spoke English. And uh, she was like, oh no, we got to get you out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, she moved, she moved me to um, closer to her family in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and that is where um, I sort of uh, got the foundation of what it meant to be an American. Mm -hmm. um, and because I really hadn't understood uh, the gravity of what it meant to be um, black. Um, I didn't even really know, um, especially being in, uh, growing up in, uh, at that, that time in Germany and with all of my uh, friends and the lady who I thought was my mother, you know. <laughs> wow, what a story. You're, are you telling me you grew up in an atmosphere when you were in Germany and growing up as a kid, your, your skin color or type or your, it just was irrelevant. You're just another kid. Yeah. And that's just, that's just how, that's how I look. And that's how they look. And the little blonde, exactly. the little blonde girl in the car, you know, just, it just never, never went across the radar. Never came across my radar. I didn't um, realize they, that, Justin. That's extraordinary because I've talked to an awful lot of colleagues, and you know, and actually, if you don't mind, guys, I'd like to, I'd like to, to talk about growing up with a sense of other, uh, if you will, um, and 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 even to the point of you know coding. You know, there's there's a way that black people or black kids are told to talk and behave in certain parts of the society. And you better be damn well careful. And we all know, I mean, quite frankly, all of us are like this with the police anymore, but especially people of color. You know, you get stopped by the police, turn the car off, put the keys on the dash, keep your hands up. And, and we've known how we know how badly that can still go. And I don't want to make light of that in, in the least. It, it's a it is a horrifyingly obscene, wrong situation. But that's not what this show's about. So we're going to go on by that. But I, I, you take me by surprise. Sorry to interrupt you because I didn't realize no, no. I've never I've never spoken to uh, an African-American child that that would have ever had that kind of experience. That that must have been what when you say to know what it was like to be black. I mean, that's a, that's a big sentence to unpack. 
Right. <laughs> I no, mean, absolutely. How did that? How did that happen? Was it a rude awakening? Was it a coding well, you know, awakening? Was it people I, in the school? Was it was it more your colleagues or 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 adults? It was. It was most so. It was instilled in me um, in a very organic, uh, loving way um, by my my family members. Um, you know, my um, she specifically moved us to the area of Georgia. Well, first of all, we moved to the south of the United States. So we right. wouldn't just move any any place in the United States, you know. So that so that in itself was was something. But uh, her parents um, were ministers, uh, and uh, so I spent a lot of time in the church. You know, my grandfather. Uh, who was the pastor of the church, you know, he's a, a Morehouse man, and he actually was classmates with Dr. King. Um, wow. So I, I learned really quickly um, the, the history um, and the significance and the, the magnificence, if you will, um, of what it, what it means uh, to be Black. Um, and uh, uh, getting older, uh, dealing with the the sort of um, negativity of my peers that weren't black, uh, and dealing with uh, uh, all all kinds of all kinds of racism, all kind uh, a small and big, if you will. Um, and the the main thing that I that I never could wrap my head around was, you know, I was I was a a boy soprano, so I I, I was I was traveling a lot and singing, you know, um, and but when I would attend school. Um, my uh, colleagues, you know, my scholastic colleagues and my teachers, they all put me in this box. I was a, I was a weird kid, you know, um, uh, and I uh, suffered with autism and it, it, they sort of just labeled me as a problem child. And, you know, this whole thing of my father being an opera singer, you know, like, oh no, your father's not an opera singer, your father's in jail, that's why he's not around. Um, and it like created this like entire picture of, of, of who I was. And to be honest with you, at a certain point, I didn't know what to believe, you know, because I was being, uh, you know, categorized and, and, and my, my family and my parents would say one thing, but I was experiencing something completely different because of the world, you know? Um, so it, it was, it was, how, it was how, did, how did music come into this? How did, so actually, did you find did you find your musical your musical DNA early and was that some kind of amelioration of the confusion? Absolutely. Uh, so I I always I always wanted to be an opera singer. Um, I obviously was influenced by my parents. Um, it was the the basically the family business, if you will. Um, <laughs> and and uh, you know it, I I looked up to them. I looked up to their colleagues. You know, uh, they had they had uh, they went to school and like were that came up at the same time as people like Harold Blackwell and like I, you know people like George Shirley were around. You know, when I was a kid, um, so like the whole novelty of a black opera singer, it was not a novelty. It was normal. It was very 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 normal for me to be surrounded by that, and that is why I wanted that. Uh, you know, so passionately, um, and actually, music ended up saving my uh my young life i think uh my my mother um moved me to uh new york city um after uh we had a conversation we had a serious conversation i i had to have been maybe nine years old um and i told her i said i want to pursue music seriously i know that i've been singing you know professionally as a child but like i want to continue this i i, I noticed that my colleagues, my young colleagues that were also, you know, boy sopranos and doing shows around the world and such, they reached a certain point, it was like 11 or 12, and then their voice changed, and then they went completely left field and did something else with their lives, and I didn't want that. I, I, I wanted, when I had the big voice change or whatever, to continue to study, to, to pursue, and to, to sing in, the, in the, the manly way, you know, that my father sang. <laughs> You know, um, so she said, okay, we're moving you to New York. You're going to join the Boys Choir of Harlem. Uh, you're going to, you're going to graduate the Boys Choir of Harlem. You're going to, you're going to go to conservatory and then you're going to like have a career. And I was like, okay, you know. <laughs> and, what, and, and what school did you go to? Say again? What school did you go to in New York? Uh, 
so I went to uh, the, the Boys Choir of Harlem and I right. would have stayed there until uh, uh, high school, uh, but they actually, um, the, the founder uh, passed away and all of uh, the people next in line, uh, it's a, a tragic story really, the people next in line to take over passed away um, and it sort of just dissolved. Um, so I went on, really? so I, yeah, so I decided to go to, to LaGuardia Performing Arts High School in Lincoln Center um, and then after that, I uh, went to the Manhattan School of Music. Yeah, uh, that's where, right. <laughs> <laughs> where, you know, we have number the one, best number one, one number one. one. <laughs> <laughs> we have literally the best faculty in the world, including Thomas Hampson and Damien Sneed. Well, um, what, can we, what can we say? I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> oh, oh, never mind. <laughs> uh, and anyway. I, and I, I stayed there, for, but, but really, I do mean that I really feel like it was the best place for me. Uh, and mm. it, it was one of the most beautiful moments of my trajectory. I, uh, when it was time to do uh, my master's uh, uh, degree, I didn't even apply anywhere else. I knew that I wanted to stay at Manhattan School of Music. Um, I had been um, studying with, um, uh, uh, when I was in high school, I had been studying with a professor at you know, our rival school, the Big J School, I won't even mention them. Um, and uh, it, it was something that I just decided, I, I, I didn't even, I didn't want to go anywhere else. Manhattan School of Music was the place for me. I loved my teacher, Kathy Malfitano. Uh, she's still my teacher to this day. Um, we do great Wonderful. work, you know, so that that's basically my story. So when you came back from Heidelberg working with me for 10 days, did, did Catherine say, no, 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 no. No, it was, it, was quite, it was quite the opposite. It was quite the opposite, to be honest with you. That, I just that, admire, I'm teasing. Is, I admire her no, so much. Seriously, st st we never music. sang together. We've known really? each other, but we've never, we never, we never sang on stage together. I don't know. She was just a little bit ahead of me in, in our career. And, and, you know, by the time she was at, at that time, it was significant. She was in lyric dramatic repertoire and I was a young lyric baritone. I didn't really get into sort of that kind of repertoire until my, until my middle forties. And, and by that time mm -hmm. she was, she was, it just didn't happen but anyway. And she's a wonderful teacher and she's doing great work at Manhattan. Anyway, Absolutely. when did we first meet? Did you just come sing for me? Was that what you did? So, so it's, it's sort of a long story, but I'll, I'll try to keep Oh, don't do a long story. Do a short story. I know, I know. I'm long-winded. This is an hour program, and we haven't even started with Damien. I'm, I'm yeah. leaving him to yeah. the last because once he starts, we don't need to talk. This guy is, yeah. you know, yeah. plugged into every light socket of music you can imagine, and I want to hear that story. But where, I we, don't remember. We, we met... We met at Columbia University. You were giving a Song of America lecture, um, and you had a couple of students from the Manhattan School of Music and a couple of students from University of Michigan perform. Right. And I, after we sort of had that performance slash masterclass slash session together, you told me you said, "Well, you're you're coming to Germany Germany with me." I had no idea what that meant, but I was like, "Okay." <laughs> that's right that's right thank you that's yeah. yes I, I remember yeah i remember that actually wonderful thank you justin damien yes. thank you for being so patient you are you 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 are a force of nature uh tell me yeah. i mean before we got on air you were saying you know where, where you had been and you've got your new opera going here and you've got concerts there your your record and accolades and getting to know your discography is is such a a kaleidoscope of expression and musicality that I can't, you know, I've been listening to you guys, both of you all afternoon, uh, getting ready for this evening and and just getting to know you better. Uh, but Damien, wh where are you from? Where did this all start? And why in the hell haven't we met until now? I'm not sure. I, I believe we were on a virtual presentation for Manhattan School of Music at one time, but I okay. hail from Augusta, Georgia. Okay. And uh, I was raised by. Oh my God! You mean parents. the golf course, Augusta? The Masters Golf Tournament, exactly. James Brown, yes. And uh, James I Brown, good. yes. Uh, and also Amy Grant and uh, Lawrence Fishburne from uh, the Matrix. But I was uh, raised by two beautiful parents. I was adopted and raised by two beautiful parents, uh, born right after the Great Depression. My mother born in September of 1933. She was the first in her family to go to college. Uh, actually, she ended up, she was the oldest in her family and ended up being the only person to go to college. And then my father, born in 1935 from uh, North Carolina, growing up on a farm, was the first in his family to go to college. So 
they really instilled the importance of education and culture. I was uh, uh, exposed to culture right in my home. When I would go to school, my uh, parents would teach me again. So I had to have lessons on the floor. Everything that I was taught at school, my father would be on the floor and reteach it. By the time I got to fifth grade, I would have to come home and fill out a lesson plan backwards at the end of each week. And I would have to teach whatever I learned in class. So that sort of started the uh, didactic educational thrust and impetus that I have because my parents would have me teach starting at fifth grade Gosh. every day when I got home to see if I was paying attention. Uh, and But there was an issue. Uh, my mother taught third grade, my father taught third through fifth, and it had a specialization in special education. When they adopted me, I was uh, mute. I didn't really talk. Uh, I looked like I had a developmental disorder. And as an African-American man, uh, young African-American boys in America, especially in the South, immediately get placed into special education, which becomes a path and a trajectory, which then leads to incarceration. So my father was very concerned. Uh, thank goodness he was a special education teacher because I did, I was labeled having autism at a very early age. Uh, they wanted to give me medications. I was hyperactive. I couldn't sit still in school. So my father had them test me again and they found out my IQ was high and I started excelling in music. So I started playing banging, as my mother would say, a toy piano around the age of three, watching an old TV show, Praise the Lord. Uh, and uh, then around uh, four and a half, I started taking piano lessons. And that's how music started. And then my father, uh, you know, studying piano, my mother studying piano, everyone had to when they grew up back in the 30s, like everybody had to take piano in the black family down south. There was like one piano or at the church. So they both said you have to have piano lessons. So I had to listen to the Hallelujah Chorus. My father would play Drop the Needle. I didn't know what that was until I got to Howard University. But my father would say, what is this? I had to listen to Hall and Oates. I had to listen to Aretha Franklin, Peggy LaBelle and perform and not just sing or play, but I had to walk out on this imaginary stage. So it's very interesting. I had wonderful parents. Um, and then all of a sudden I started speaking, but I stuttered. I had a very, very bad speech impediment. And uh, my grandmother prayed over me. It was very weird. I didn't find this out so much later. Uh, she prayed over me, I think, and told my parents, let me keep him. And then I started speaking properly. And that was very bad because everyone picked on me. Because uh, growing up down south, you may hear a little bit of my dialect, but I began speaking properly because that's the only way I could speak. Uh, and so I was made fun of. Uh, then on top of that, it didn't help that I was a musician, a uh, church musician, and I did classical music. A lot of uh, African-American musicians grow up uh, in the church or in the community with an ear, but I grew up reading music first. My ear didn't develop until later on, maybe around uh -huh. eighth, ninth grade. Um, but I had a chance to meet Wynton Marsalis and it changed my life. He's a great mentor. Uh, seeing someone who won a Grammy Award Artist of the Year in classical and jazz, it sort of shaped my uh, path so that I would not allow myself to be placed in a box. As many people said, well, you're in high school, you need to just do jazz. So in ninth grade, I won... Uh, I was the jazz pianist in the state of Georgia, the top jazz pianist. Then I also won the classical p uh, solo piano competition that year. And then I was also singing and I would sing competitions. I was playing clarinet, playing in the orchestra, acting. And people said, you're doing too much. Uh, so it became a bit of a, a pressure because people always said, you need to do one thing. So many people told me you will not have a career. You will not be successful doing all these genres. But I said, if Winton can do it and other people can do it, why can't I? So the way I think about music is that it's just a way of expression. The genre doesn't matter. I have the tools. I have the understanding, the theoretical training, the classical technique to be able to apply it to any style of music and to be able to create. Uh, I never thought I'd be a conductor or a, comp uh, a composer. I was just a pianist and enjoyed singing and working with vocalists. But there was a young girl uh, in her after her freshman year who sang at my parents wedding before they adopted me years before they adopted me and that young girl happened to be Jesse Norman so when I was <laughs> growing up uh, I would get in trouble if I was doing homework if I was asleep or if I was outside playing basketball with my friends I'd have to come inside and we'd watch live from Lincoln Center to see Jesse Norman and that changed my life I also remember my father would make me watch the Donahue show when an artist was on, I had to watch the episode with Aretha Franklin. He said, you know, one day you're going to be like Aretha Franklin. Uh, I'll be dead and gone on. That's a Southern saying. But anyways, to make a long story short, uh, I ended up going to Howard University to follow in Jesse Norman's footsteps. Uh, I met a phenomenal teacher, Dr. Raymond Jackson, who studied at the Juilliard School, won Absolutely. several international competitions, and yeah. his dissertation was on the music of African-American composers. So then I found a niche. 
I, I met uh, Albert Dodge and Pratt. I met Andre Watts, all there at Howard. And I began to uh, engraft within me the music of African-American composers, not just solo piano music, not just vocal music, because Sylvia Oden Lee was also at Howard University. Wow. So she wow. downloaded wow. all of this information about Marian yeah. Anderson, yeah. Lansing yeah. Price. Yeah. Lansing Price came to the school. Like I got I to meet it. all these people. Uh, you know, Louis Farrakhan came and she played a company him a violin. So it was chamber music, it was opera. Carmen Balthrop, I played for her studio, who did the opera uh, Tree Manisha and sang at the Met. So all of these great singers were just there. Matawilda Dobbs, you know, just, I would just go no. from lesson you to met lesson. her? Yeah, she, she was a teacher at Howard. So ah. it, it was so amazing. So by the time I graduated from Howard, start, uh, then meeting Jesse Norman, having performed with Winston Marsalis, doing jazz, doing the gospel choir, uh, I decided- you, I mean, you worked, with, you worked with Aretha Franklin as well. Yes, yes. You did I, a show for her. Say. I had a chance to work with her the last four years of her life, actually because she wanted me to teach her classical piano because I had been working at Juilliard on faculty. And I went to Peabody Conservatory and NYU for film scoring. And it's so interesting. When I was in uh, sixth grade, my mother called Walter Turnbull at the boys choir and said, okay. we'd like for our son to go to New York and join the choir academy. And he said, well, you'll have to move there. And my parents thought about it. They actually put the house up for sale. And the last minute, my mother and father said no. I had no idea that I would be the, the last accompanist for the boys' choir the last year before he passed and everything happened. And Justin was a little wee little tot, a little, little, little lad there. You know, I didn't know him, but I remember seeing, you know, this little guy just walking around. Well, I looked at photos. So it's so serendipitous. It's so serendipitous that I had an opportunity to be with Jesse Norman, do her final recital uh, at uh, yeah. Teatro, uh, Grand uh, Teatro du Chatelet in France and play on her last recording. Uh, we became very, very, very close. Uh, I've been blessed with so many great mentors like uh, uh, Jesse Norman, went to Marsalis, Aretha Franklin, who loved classical music. And uh, I went to Manhattan School of Music and I had to drop out because my father died uh, of cancer right before I started school there after getting a scholarship. And then I found out my mother had advanced dementia and it was very difficult. I had to drop out of school to pay like over four to 5,000 a month for a caretaker. That was a 10 year journey. So it, it is full circle that now I'm on the faculty at, at uh, Manhattan School of Music after teaching at NYU where I went to school and Juilliard and other places. And I met a, a great friend of ours, all of ours, uh, Janae Bridges, who oh uh, Sean works with uh, so well. And Sean and I had a chance to meet for my work with Lawrence Brownlee, uh, writing spiritual sketches, which was just on a whim. And then all of a sudden people are like, oh, you're a composer. I'm like, I am a composer. I didn't know. I was just using tools I learned in class. And then I started writing operas. I had a chance to meet Sean. Uh, he was very kind. I remember uh, at the performance at uh, the Lyric Opera Chicago, you know, and Justin as well. So there's so many connections. Um, and so music is really in me from conducting the Abyssinian Mass and our Winton's All Rise Symphony, which yeah. just the solos in both of them, uh, to working with Aretha Franklin, doing gospel music, the Clark Sisters, uh, being on television. I wanted to mention something though. Uh, we're Appreciate talking about the music in my story. As a black man, you mentioned something and my people may have seen my face freeze a little bit, but I wanna bring it back up. You were very apropos and correct. And it's a very prescient topic. I remember being dressed in a tuxedo, leaving uh, Lincoln Center from a performance with the Playbill program in the back of my European car. And I was driving back to Queens, Jamaica, Queens, where I live in a home. And I remember being pulled over by the police and they said, what are you doing in this car? And me being from the South, you know, raised by older parents, they're both deceased now. I have an attitude quickly with that. So I have to stay calm, as you just said. And I said, what do you mean? What am I doing in this car? It's my car. Oh, sure. You're probably just the help. Were you a valet and you, you, you drove this car away? And I really got offended. And I said, no, I'm a musician. Oh, yeah. What do you play? Jazz? I said, I do. But I actually was coming from a classical concert. Sure you were. So I said, can I reach? No, I said, can I reach in the back and get the playbill? They put the flashlight on. I, they took out the playbill. They said, oh, it's really you. It matches your ID. Well, why are you in a tuxedo? Because I was there performing and conducting. And they said, well, we're going to have to arrest you. This just doesn't add up. No one like you should be driving a brand new European luxury car like this. And This and, is and in Queens. You know, this and is they in Queens, arrest, New York. This is in Queens. They couldn't arrest me with any, uh, for any particular reason. So I didn't have regular... Uh, metal, uh, metal handcuffs they put plastic handcuffs on me and they made me sit in the precinct and it broke me down and because of situations like that I could go on and on I found that my calling uh, being a black man in America an American as well is that I have to represent that's one of the reasons why I have natural hair and it's in a mohawk uh, because I remember going to Carnegie Hall to conduct and 
Several people told me you'll never walk on Carnegie Hall stage as a black man with a mohawk conducting. And Jesse Norman said, how dare you listen to that? Keep your natural hair. You know, she used to wear hair, head wraps and stuff. So I found that it, it's important for me to be present and to be like an in sample in the earth globally to show that black people were, were judged by wearing a hoodie. I could give you a story about that. You know, because I have natural hair, it doesn't mean that I'm not learned. It does not mean that I'm not cultured, that I'm not intelligent, that I can exist in any style of music that's thrown in front of me. I can exist in any world. And you talked about code switching. I can speak in a jazz, uh, you know, jargon or R&B or gospel or classical. I can speak different languages, working as a conductor with singers. But, you know, I love it when people judge me based on the visual. And then when I begin to talk, they see something different. And uh, I think it's important, people like Sean, that are writing things about the the killing in, in Charleston, South Carolina, it's like, he's actually like a film scoring writer to me because it, it's so uh, full of just the sounds and the emotion, but that's why I do what I do. That's why, you know, me growing up, people talked about my large lips. So you and Justin both sing Margaret Bond's setting of Langston Hughes' Minstrel Man because my mouth is wide. You know, my lips are large. You know, this is the reason why I do what I do to show people that other young black people, other people of color, other people, no matter what color they are, you do not have to be in a box. Uh, you can have roots and culture, but you can exist and be whatever you want to be, and you can do that well, and you can do it uh, without being living in a space of mediocrity, but with excellence. So that is why, if it's writing, if it's conducting, if it's collaborating, if it's taking a back seat as an artist, you know, I have my own tours. But I don't mind supporting other people. I don't mind cheering on Sean. You know, Sean is always. I have to say this because it's not common. Sean is always cheering me on. He's always supporting me. Everybody and, got, that. and, 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 and one of your colleagues of at MSN is Terry Blanchard, you know, the other, exactly. another great voice coming in, in America, right? Exactly. But I know I've been talking, but but it, no, the support that I have from these two uh, men who are really on on top of the world, uh, just doing it at a very high level, it's it's sincere. Uh, they're very rooted. They have a great foundation. I've known both of them for a number of years. Sean, not as closely, but it, it's always supportive. And I'm just so happy to see other people of color, other American men, breaking the, the the barriers, you know, breaking the mold. And thank you and Adagio, and thank you for your uh, foundation, just for pro providing a platform and an opportunity for people to get to know us, to hear our music. Uh, you know, yes, I, I wrote an opera on Marian Anderson and uh, yeah, I know. my next opera's on James Baldwin, but you know, Sean, Sean is working on an opera, he's writing, writing symphonies. Uh, he has several song cycles. Justin is doing so many amazing things and singing both of our music. It's just an honor uh, that we have this space, even in the pandemic, being sequestered at home, to be able to reach people, let them hear our art, whether we're singing or creating and performing leader in German or arias in Italian or French or Russian or Czech, no matter what it is, our English, our spirituals, our gospel. We are just so grateful for having an opportunity to express our gifts our arts and why we've been placed here on the earth. Thank you. That's be Thank beautiful, you, Damien. But, you know, and, and, and let me just, I mean, we got this, 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 this can't be a three hour program and yet it could <laughs> easily be one. It's, it's, there's so much to talk about. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that everybody listening is riveted by your individual stories and we could drill down on each one of them, but, but it would probably turn more sociological than mm -hmm. I think we want to be. I want to, I want to stay in the music. I want people to know enough about your lives, difficult or, or challenging or rewarding or enlightening as they have been, but, but you've all landed in your particular talents and, and, and music, and you're sharing that in, in the description of the, of the project in Hamburg. And, and by the way, let me be specific. On the 26th and the 27th and on the 31st, we are going to film digitally. We're going to film live the concerts. There will not be a public. It will be a digital process. They will then be shown as live performances on the, I believe, 4th, uh, 2nd, 4th, and 6th of June, the next week in June. But we will be filming the concerts live, as it were. We won't, we're not going to create something. Um, one of the advantages, well, that we have to do that. That's just what's going on in, in Germany right now. But the 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 point I was going to make is that even in the preamble about this, that that there's been there's been so there are so many reasons that can be obviously born in racism and political issues and sociological tapestries of our country that are ununderstandable to us as well as the rest of the world. But the point is this music 
is for everyone. Yes. And that's why this, this project is so near and dear to my heart. And of course, several years ago, I, I became aware of the African-American Song Alliance and Daryl Taylor. And because of Daryl Taylor, I got to know Louise Toppin. And, and now I have with my foundation, is a, we have a, a, a partnership and project of singing justice called yes. Singing Justice at the University of Michigan. And she is actually my co-curator for this project, Louise. She's an amazing scholar, an amazing musician, amazing, amazing human being. Um, and and so this this, you know, we're 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 focusing all into this, into these, into these programs, but it is such and what my colleagues, starting with Justin and going on up to Larry Brownlee and and uh, Leah Hawkins, who I had on the other day, uh, as well as as uh, 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 Jasmine uh, Barnes, there we are. Uh, but um, and 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 who else is singing? Uh, Louise is singing. Uh, Leah is singing. Justin is singing. Larry is singing. I'm singing. Emma Nikolovska, who is a, a white Canadian girl now living in Berlin, one of the finest of the next generation of of leader singer that I know. I'm so proud of her and have been working with her and and watching her develop. She's one of and she just loved this 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 project. But to, just Hodges conducting, correct? Uh, Roderick Cox is conducting the Bremen yes. Kamo Orchestra, which mm -hmm. is really exciting. I only met him because of this project as well. And mm -hmm. we have Howard Watkins and and Joseph uh, Jorbet uh, on the piano yes. for the for the, for the program. Enjoy. So egg, they are just you know I've worked with Howard a lot at the Met and called him up, and of course they're for everybody knows everybody. But what I was going to say is that all of you guys, all of all of the the not you guys but the singer guys, the singer call colleagues brought to me i would say i would say damn near a half of the repertoire especially in the second program the first program is all dedicated to langston hughes uh in german and in english but i know i would say both both leader evenings recital evenings i would say almost a half of the repertoire are living composers and this is really exciting and and that's why to have jasmine barnes and have damien sneed and and sean Oh, Pebelo. I got it. Yeah. Uh, you know, as well as uh, who else we have coming in there? We have, oh, I, I should have the list in front of me. I don't want to, I don't want to say the wrong names. Uh, David Baker is being played. Richard Thompson is going to be on next week. Uh, have a chat with him. So, you know, we've got quite a, quite a lineup. Richard Thompson rewrote his cycle of Langston Hughes in the baritone key for me. <laughs> so I'm I and and I was also very pleased to help him get his opera produced on on recording. So you amazing know, I, opera. I mean, let me let me well, listen. I don't want to be. I don't want to seem like I'm trying to be clever here. But in 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 my preamble, and thank you for picking up on the sociological fact that 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 there are different existences for different kinds of people, and especially people of color in, in America. And, and no one can deny that. No one should try to deny that. And some of the political horseshit that's coming out lately, it should be called that. Uh, of course, there is systemic racism. Uh, my question to anybody is, if there wasn't systemic racism, then why would you need legislation called voter rights? <laughs> you know. So, But we're, that's not what this show is about. What I want to ask you, is I've, I've found myself describing because I'm so fascinated and I keep discovering jewels of the 20s, jewels of the 30s, jewels of the 40s. I personally think William Grant still is the most unrecognized American symphonist that we have in the repertoire. I don't care African-American or not. He's just a great composer, represents a great era of symphonic music and is is wholly and unjustifiably unknown people made of the african-american symphony but forget about that go listen to the third symphony go listen to the to the heavenly regions of the fifth symphony this stuff is just you know and of course how about the nine or ten operas of which you know louise has done a couple and we're going to do big excerpts of highway one what a what a wonderful title but i found myself describing all of this for people using the phrase parallel universe. We know we know Copeland, we know Barber. We're, I'm trying to get rid of their great, great composers. We have, you know, Ned Roram, unbelievable song composer. You know, you can go through the line, but somewhere one step in back of that or to the side of it or ununderstood has been this continual 
overwhelming creativity in the African-American community, and not just spirituals and not just gospels, but not there. It, it, is, is that overstating it? And, 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 I'll, and, and the second part of that question is, I had Anthony Green on the other day, and Anthony Green was really, it was very funny, because he said, yeah, a couple of my, you know, black colleagues, we got together, we thought we should do America, uh, uh, black American music. And they all kind of went, who's that? <laughs> so am, am, is this a subject that, that should be talked about? Is this, are, you, are you happy that, that, that there seems to be an enlivened uh, in, interest in, in uh, African-American <laughs> classical music in general, not just your own? Yeah, I, I think part of the issue is that a lot of the publishers that were around that gave African-American composers opportunities to have their music published are no longer around. A lot of the music was destroyed in fires. It's sitting in uh, attics. It's sitting in boxes. People don't know where a lot of them are. Uh, and so it's important that uh, scholars like Daryl Taylor, uh, people like uh, Louise Toppin, uh, that they revive this music and republish it. So, because uh, you know, at Manhattan School of Music, our president, Jim Gandry, uh, created an initiative for all students to perform on the recitals music of African right. and African-American creators. But then the faculty were like, well, where do I find the music? So I was trying to talk to the librarian, but where is this music? You know, and that's why sometimes when people order my music, I just give it to a library because I know it's going to be performed. Uh, and, you know, people are singing our names, but there are other African-American composers that people don't know about. Right. Yeah, I, I was going to say, you know, uh, you know, Damon, you mentioned, um, I love your, I always love hearing your story, the idea of support and, and, and um, we have to support each other. And, um, but what, what's tied to that is, you know, I'll get, you know, maybe a commission um, and, that I can't do because I'm, I'm, I'm busy doing something else. And they want an African-American composer. So I give them like seven, eight other names. They're like, oh, this, but yet we're everywhere. Like we're, we are literally everywhere, you know? Um, um, and so, um, yeah, so, 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 so the, the beauty is, you know, they're, they're recognizing that, you know, we have a voice, we're, we are, we have music out there, the composers out there. The tragedy is they just don't, we don't, they don't know, uh, you know, who, who's really out there. And so it's, I think it's our duty. Um, and again, Damon with that and, um, you know, it, it too, it's, it's just, and also as performers, you know, Justin, to, to, to perform these works of composers that you may not, you, you may never have heard of uh, that are doing their thing and are doing it well. And, and, it, and, and it's really, truly extraordinary. You know, um, so yeah. Would you say that most of the of the music, well, probably the obvious, it's an obvious question, but most of the music to date by African American composers and and poets has been performed or is known by, if it's known by African American artists? No, it's not because they go to conservatories where the teachers can't teach it to them. The music is not there. Uh, people are not inviting people like a Raymond Jackson and a Louise Toppin to schools enough to talk about this. And, and, and for Justin Austin to really be like Jesse Norman and create a, a niche and a space for himself, he doesn't do the standard baritone arias that everybody does for right. auditions and every week. He's always programmed new composers, even a, an American composer, Ricky Ian Gordon, who I love, who's not African-American, but he wrote uh, on Langston Hughes. Oh my, wrote, oh, but, but phenomenal rock songwriter. And, and, and thank you for recording the music of Margaret Bonds, but performers have to begin making it normal and normalizing music. And also, sorry, maybe by Asian Americans and by yeah. Irish Americans and, you know, yeah. uh, Native Americans, you know, the, the performers have to do this. And that's really what's going to help people like Sean and I continue to be alive and our names to continue to live or people performing our music. Right. Justin, jump in. What are you thinking? You what know, about your I, what about I, your generation I, I in general? Well, I, I, I agree with uh, what Damien is saying as far as in our training, uh, the people who are in charge of the material and what is taught, that is not a part of the curriculum for some reason. And you know, it's it, I think when when certain um, uh, performers find out when we finally find out about these extraordinary gifts um, a, 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 of composing from from these uh, uh, composers like Ricky or uh, any of the African-American composers, then we 
we have an opportunity to, to deliver these messages, to perform these works, to celebrate them. Because to be honest with you, I, I didn't know about Margaret Bonds until Catherine Alfitana. I didn't right. know wow. about Harry T. Burley until Michael Barrett. I didn't know, you know about Anthony Davis uh, until Damian Jeter. I didn't know, uh, you, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, and this is, these, this, I grew up in a, a musical family, you know, uh, uh, and I grew up with the black experience, if you will. And, and, but, and, but both of my parents uh, graduated from Juilliard and they weren't championed to do uh, this type of programming, right. you know? Um, and no shade to Juilliard or whatever, but you know what I'm saying. No, 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 but I think it's important we just put a little bit of perspective here. Actually, in the study of musicology, it was not possible until maybe 15 or 20 years ago, and I mean, recent, recent history, to actually study American music. If you were a musicologist, you had to study wow. everything else, and it was about that, and you may be interested in American music. There was no particular curriculum or no particular, you know, dissertation path in American, whatever the hell, the professor would say whatever the hell that is that you could even study. So, you know, I think that I've asked I've asked this question pretty consistently of, of all of all the colleagues of any nationality and, and culture. Are we at a are we at a new tipping point for repertoire? Are we are we are we they're not a new tipping point? Are we at a tipping point where you can feel that there's more interest specifically in the Black American community or in, in general, your creative work or the creative work of the canon that will come into the major organizations and symphonies. Do you think that we're going to get there? I think it's going to take another three generations. Tipping point, no. Opening, uh, an opening, yes. Uh, when competitions okay. start requiring not just a spiritual, but if they say an art song by an African-American composer. See, that's you mentioned that. Uh, you're very astute and you're very up on this. A lot of times, like Sean said, they only want us to, well, he didn't say this, I'll say this. I always make these comments. A lot of times the African-American or Black composers only ask to do something for the Pops Symphony or for Black History Month or for Black Music Month. And they want a spiritual or they want jazz. I remember a major opera company said, well, why do you have all of these uh, classical themes in, in your music? This is not what we want. I'm like, what did you want? We wanted that abizu, shasazis. I said, what is that? We wanted that jazz, the music of your people. I said, well, the music of my people is also uh, the other styles. Well, don't all Black women just sing gospel? And, ah, ah, ah. and I said, no, they don't. And I said, all, Af all African-American church experiences are not gospel. Some people in the African American church, even with black music, it's a classically trained voice. So there, there has to be a shift in uh, the thought, and part of that is media, part of that is film, the film industry, because you know there's always a church scene. And when I write operas, are you going to put a church scene in it? Oh well, what do you want? Do you want Pearly? Nothing against Pearly. I love that Broadway show, but you know some of this typecasting. And one opera company told me one time, well, why is the why are the characters speaking with correct subject and verb agreement. I'm like, what do you mean? Well, well, your people don't speak with subject and verb agreement. And why do they have a garden? Shouldn't they be in asphalt on the projects? Really? Well, I didn't grow up like that. I had several gardens in my yard. I mean, you know, and, and I'm not I hear, I hear, I hear. gluten. Like I'm, I'm Southern, I'm down to earth. But this mindset no, that true. we're always on Catfish Row, that we're always you know, my side's getting to it, my star, my say, you know, and that, I, that is appropriate. And it's a time period. Histor the historicity, it's appropriate. But we also can be in an imaginary position. We can have uh, futurism, Afrofuturism. We can be doctors and lawyers and we can speak intelligibly and intelligibly and we can speak other languages. Look at Justin. He was born in, in Germany. And right. it's normal. It's real. Sean is an African uh, the descendant, really. You know, so it's like, Anyways, I'll, I'll get off my hand words. No, no, Damien, it's, it, that's exactly why you're here tonight. I, I love it. Go for it, Sean. Tell me. It's funny because, um, like, when I say classical composer, I'm, like, strictly, that's my upbringing. And so it was later on, um, and I can resonate with you, Justin, learning about all these composers. It was later on uh, that, 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 that I learned that. So when, when people, now, I've, I've, obviously, my spirituals and other things um, have become, you know, popular, 
that's like not the most natural for me. So, mm. so you go to my my, my, my website or or, or or listen to my music, you hear some music that's kind of maybe out there or more like you know, um, and they don't really expect that because they, they 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 hear the spirituals or they hear uh, my black churches, which by the way, I I love that type of stuff that I do. In fact, I may even like it better than than my quote. I don't know, contemporary classical stuff, whatever that means. But but it, it's just funny how people are kind of confused. I'm like, I don't I don't do jazz. In fact, I have a good ear and I kind of mimic it. I'm fake, but I'm no Damien Sneed. Like I, I fake it, you know, like 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 <laughs> you know I, it's it's interesting. You do you do have uh, the two of you, I mean obviously you have mm -hmm. very distinct voices and it's very interesting, it's very interesting to hear where you know the echoes of of yourselves that start coming into the music that you that you're composing. I I, I very much like that, and I think it's very beautiful. We're Sean or Justin. You're singing Sean's songs. Are you singing Damien, or we or is it, or actually I think I think Larry's singing some stuff of Damien's. Is that right? Uh, Larry, Larry is singing uh, some Damien's, uh, but I, I'm also singing uh, "I Dream a World," which Damien All composed right. for. Uh, our Carnegie Hall recital debut in 2017. All right. yeah. And what are you singing of Sean's? I'm singing his adaptation of O oh Freedom that right. he wrote for Will Liverman, another fabulous Black Bear <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please write these names down and go to their websites. And 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 I love websites. I love going and finding people's websites. If you go to idonjo.com, you will find both gentlemen modestly represented. Uh, and we're gonna we're gonna get to that. Idonjo is building and expanding all the time, and I'm working behind the scenes uh, under the motive of yes, idonjo.com needs more diversity. Uh, and, and and that's great. Loading up loading up stuff is is fun. And idajo.com is the most extensive streaming platform for classical music in the world. And it's it's extraordinary, huge database. Uh, and you know the first the first thing is to get I guess everything that I mean there's over there's over twenty thousand classical composers on this website. I didn't know there were twenty thousand classical composers. Did you know there's twenty thousand? So anyway, it's huge. The streaming world I think is a very it's a very big world and it's a very future world, but we'll we'll get there. But go to the websites, check out these these gentlemen's music. There are some associations in all of their bios and about this and that that you can go to other composers as well. Certainly, uh, when we uh, right now, you can get an overview of the programs on the Elp Philharmonie uh, website. Dot D A E L B Elp Philharmonie, um, like we would say Philharmonic. Uh, you can find it as E L B P H I L M nine harmony H A R M O I N E dot D E. Yeah, okay. Go to the notes. We'll 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 send you there. Sorry about that spelling contest. Um, uh, and and get a look at all of this fantastic material. We should have evidences of all the repertoire up by the time we do the concerts. But I think you 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 will enjoy it. Okay, give us in the last few minutes. Thank you for giving us all this time. And I'm just going to go right on over the top of our time. We that's the nice thing about this digital program. We can talk for three hours if you want. But I know you I know you guys are busy, and I don't want to take up more time. But maybe maybe Sean and 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 Damien. What are you doing now? What, what's going on now? You, Damien, when I read your website, I see We Shall Overcome. I see some opera projects that are that are moving. And, and by the way, I just want to say that, you know, in all of our lives, we have a handful of people that we just feel good on earth because there are we, we get to call them the, our friend. And that's how I feel about Wynton Marsalis. You know, I, I, Jesse... My debut as a concert singer in Salzburg Festspiel was with Jesse Norman in the Mahler Deska Namad Wunderhorn. Uh, it was very funny because she was obviously coming late and I was there and it was the motto and, and he was very nervous whether I could actually do it. And, and then it turned out I could, uh, which is a good deal. But when Jesse showed up, we were still doing Kanaban Wunderhorn songs as duets, which is a bad, bad, bad tradition. And now that I'm a co-editor of the, never mind, that's another story. But she showed up and she looked at the music and she said, oh, no, that's the wrong key, as she could be. And, and 
and so you know immediately the librarian you know whoosh, and uh, you know magically new music and keys appeared on the stands and everyone like this and and the, i remember the concert master was this great gentleman uh vetzel was his name really a stalwart of the right and and so Abato kind of looked at me and and Jesse and and, and there were like three songs. He said, "Oh no, wrong key. Who told you this? No, no. I sing it higher. I sing it lower. Right." So we just did it. We just did it, and we just changed keys. And Vetzel came up to me. I said, "I don't think I've ever seen a, a young colleague do that and not talk about. I'm mean, just you know another key." And I said, "You know." whatever you know nah, 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 nah. fortunately i don't have perfect pitch so it's not a bit it wasn't a big issue but um jesse was very she was always extraordinarily kind to me i haven't i have her book on singing and i i almost enjoy more the fact that i haven't read it because i tell people to buy this book for the cover and the title stand up straight and sing justin knows why i'm going off on that you know stand up straight and sing great woman anyway tell me guys what are you up to what are you working on yeah there we are what what a singer i went to i don't know how many recitals her in Salzburg over the years just admired her enormously anyway there we are we all we all get to pass it on for a while there we are what are you up to sean um a couple projects um um uh, doing a, a new trio for the Winston Trio for, the, for this year. I am working on, um, this year is the, uh, a big anniversary year of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldiers. So I've been commissioned by uh, Urban Arias, Rift Trap, and I think Minnesota Opera to do um, uh, this, I don't know what you call it, um, song cycle narrative opera-ish thing about, about the Tomb of the Unknown Soldiers. I'm wow. working uh, I'm working on uh, two operas, uh, one for the Chicago Opera Theater, a chamber opera, and, uh, and a special project with uh, Cincinnati Opera, a uh, grand opera. So. You got your plate full. Have you written a lot of, how many songs have you written? Is, is song writing a big deal for you? Do you do it because you love it or well, because you get a commission? It's funny because, uh, it, you know, <laughs> like, my, early in my career, you, you'd have thought that I would be this chamber music or orchestral composer or band composer, but I've done this weird and beautiful shift to a lot of songwriting, and I love writing songs. Uh, now I'm kind of how, how did that come up? I mean, did someone say, "Look, I want you to write a song cycle," and and how well, look at it? Or do you search out your own poets? No, I, I think because of, of 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 my spirituals, because my I call them yeah. reimagin I call them reimaginations, um, and I treat them honestly like like leader. Um, um, you know, they're duos, for one, uh, duos for, for piano and voice. And, um, and so the way I- Without question. Them, yeah, I, the way I approach them, they, they I, I think they sound more like, like, like leader than, than the traditional spiritual. Um, and, and, I, and, and because since then, doing song cycles and then things like that, it's, it's kind of, I love the voice, I just, I just, I just do. And, and I've gotten to, again, work with like Will and Janae and, and having good collaborators uh, helps uh, with your passion for writing for voice. I remember hearing Janae the first time when I was in Chicago doing something and I gave a class and she was in the Young Artists program there. And, and she sang, I believe she sang a Bernstein piece. And I looked at her, I said, why aren't we working on Urlicht of Mahler? And she said, I haven't sung it yet. I'm, I'm terrified. And I said, I can imagine. Let's have a go. And, and so sometime later, we got to work on that and talk about it. What a wonderful singer. She's always been. But it was just, you know, she started to sing and, you know, everybody just their eye, your eyes lit up and you're kind of, OK, that'll do. Yeah, we'll, we'll go there. The same thing with Nadine, Nadine Sierra. I was I was sitting on a on a on a, on a panel. Uh, I hate competitions. I, I you can only win a competition and, and being a judge on a competition is not what I do. I like to work with my colleagues and get them ready for a competition, but never mind. So I'm sitting there at a competition and out comes this 19 year old girl uh, and sings three Strauss songs. And I just, I just, you know, put 10 on my little slip and I handed it to the, to the foreman. I said, can I go play golf? 
yeah. and, and I said, no, no, we've got 18 more singers. I said, no, you don't. It doesn't, it doesn't matter who sings. It's, we're done. This, I've never heard a 19 year old ever sing Strauss like this. This just this is this girl certainly should be given the the eggs and all the other. I was being a bit facetious and funny, but there's some extraordinary singers coming along, right? So Damien, do you write for your singers? Do you how do you come up with the, the ideas for the operas you want to do or the song? Have you written a lot of songs? I've got three questions for you. Have you written a lot of songs? Do you like to write a songs or the commissions? That's all one question. When you are thinking of operas, are they your ideas or how do they gestate? And do you write for the voices that you can imagine for that? Uh, yes, I'm very fortunate to be able to work with uh, great singers like Justin and uh, Will Liverman and Brandy Sutton and different uh, singers. And oh, Janine. Brandy's one, yeah. So and I can Will. sort of imagine things uh, for their voices. Uh, part of the the new commissions I, I guess are things i'm doing as far as composition i was just commissioned by the march on washington film festival to create a chamber work uh to celebrate the life of polly murray uh i was commissioned by the tuskegee airmen to uh, create a oh, symphony fantastic in honor of them uh of course the the new a opera symphony. a symphony yes oh, a symphony, yes uh my new opera the tongue and the lash uh with libretto by karen chilton about the james baldwin william buckley debate and I just received the Kingsford Commission uh, from ASCAP to write a song cycle, uh, libretto by Karen Chilton again, uh, but it'll be for Janae Bridges. Uh, and then I'm doing some conducting uh, work with uh, the Tulsa Symphony for Winton's All Right Symphony for the Greenwood Massacre coming up. And I have a recording of Stravinsky's uh, Soldier's Tale Suite and Winton Marsalis's Fiddler's Tale Suite with Black uh, or African-American principal uh, musicians like Anthony McGill and clarinet from the New York Philharmonic and Weston Sprott from the uh, from the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. So just uh, it's about eight eight or nine uh, musicians along with uh, Andre De Shields who got an Emmy Award wow, and a Grammy, yeah. uh, you know, from the Wiz and stuff. So just working on that stuff. And then I have a couple tours coming up. I just want to mention one of those tours. Please. Uh, one of them is called Our Song, Our Story. It features Brandy Sutton and another phenomenal singer who you should know, Rahan Bryce Davis, mezzo-soprano. And it's gonna be with the uh, all black- I, I, I do know her. Piano. Yeah. yeah, so that's gonna be great. And we're gonna be celebrating and uh, the names of people like Marian Anderson and Jesse Norman and the music of African-American composers. And uh, there's also some new commissions uh, from other composers coming out with that. So that's some things you know, I'm working on. It, it, it that's fun, it fantastic and i know that you did this you have this new record out with uh with larry brownley yes uh spiritual sketches oh wonderful now yeah. i want to just just talk about this spiritual just briefly in closing out here and that is that I, I was very impacted i had this conversation with with george shirley uh first and 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 then talking to larry about it because roland hayes the great african-american singer tenor forefather to to george shirley teacher in fact mentor uh same generation as as uh, as marion anderson and paul robeson you know great iconic singers uh represented america in in very difficult times uh in europe and were thought of great a lot by the way do you guys know kira thurman at the university of michigan who's done all this wonderful uh yes. original work on on african diaspora to europe she's she's actually writing all of the notes for the programs and and stuff and the podcast for the project in hamburg uh which i'm incredibly proud of that she that she signed on for that but my point was this idea of the spiritual you know roland hayes used to call his evenings of spirituals african-american folk songs and he treated them like a diary of the african-american nation rather than just the idea that they were singing spirituals because the cliche around spirituals was you know uh, you know going home going home or steal away or whatever else and 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 the lament of some of some uh, um, disparate and 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 disassociated personality probably a slave and so forth but he actually he liked to present these evenings as as an evidence of that culture which resonates extremely strongly with me because that's exactly what I think the arts are and that's certainly what I think songs all about that's why I made my foundation I think that song poetry especially classic song poetry set to music is like a diary of any particular epoch any particular uh culture 
any particular language. It's a, it's a diary, it's an evidence of those lives lived. And, and the timelessness, the timelessness of it is, is, is to me a human story. And, and, and the drill downs are the prisms through which we see that story. But I, I, I have, I, maybe I'm wrong. You guys jump on me right now. I mean, if I sing, I too sing America, the words of a black man, dis, disingenuized from society, we're disassociated. To me, the identification is, it's, it's not the same, but it's the same outsider as Tambug said of, of, of Mahler. It's, it's the same victim or fateful context of a human being in a in a wronged situation and of course out of that poem comes this this exhilarating pride of of racial existence and even specifically color i find that i find it for me as a white man an honor to sing that and and I know that I know that there's going to be a lot of discussion about why, why is this white guy so in, involved in this and what about white people singing this kind of stuff and we're going to have that discussion I think it should be very lively but my I'm making something of such demonstrably appreciable social context hearable realizable so that everybody can unpack it as we now say in today's world for themselves um, do you guys have any problem with that I would. I, I would love to be a part of that conversation later because it's a big can of worms. Justin and I speak about this often, but it's, you know, it's important that the music is heard as, as long as there's an appropriate uh, cultural context and the person singing it understands what the intent Clear. was from the composer and what the person was trying to say and that it doesn't come across as being uh, 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 like a caricature, so to speak, our, our, our minstrelsy are you know Jim Crow to the, to that effect, but it's the same thing as someone who's African American playing the role of Pinkerton, or it's the same role as someone who's Italian or German singing uh, Butterfly. You know, so it's the it's exactly. the same thing. And if people want equality all the way around, they, I think it's okay for everyone to sing everyone's music, only if the understanding and the intent is there, and it's not something that's just thrown on you know that's what george shirley said specifically about porgy and bess because they say well can can non-black singers sing porgy and bess and george shirley's hell yes as long as they know what they're singing and why but you're right it's a, it is a it's not can of worms has a kind of a negative it is a very complex subject that i hope that our performances will bring people to talk about but go ahead sean jump in and then and then justin uh george shirley moments actually you mentioned him it was at the African American Alt Song Alliance Conference in 2017, um, um, he was in the audience, and I, I can't remember now if it was a master class or whatnot. But a but a white singer uh, asked that question. You know, um, how do you feel about white people singing the spiritual? And George Shirley, his answer, he just and he sits back. He's in the audience, and he just just belts out this beautiful uh, uh, Schubert lead and sings it just beautifully. He says, if I can sing Schubert, you can sing spiritual, right? But then he didn't stop there. He did uh, unpack it more, kind of what Damien was saying about context and yeah, sure. uh, why we're doing it. But, but I thought it was, that was just a beautiful uh, embodied moment where he just, just sang Schubert. Like it was, and it was natural, right? Justin. Well, you know, I think that I agree with, with every, what everyone has said. Um, I think that in order for us to progress as people, all of us, it, there, there needs to be this coming together. And, and I don't think that can happen uh, unless we give up this uh, false uh, sense of uh, mind, you know, minds, you know, um, and it, it's a situation where we do need to understand the history you know, the origins of these things, no matter who is singing and what we're singing, we need to understand the history and the origins of it. Uh, and as long as we have that in order, then I think it's important for not just one demographic of people uh, to perform something if we want it to be heard and understood across all mediums and, and all, you know, different cultures. Um, because that is what, that is what, 
we we believe in, I think, uh, as far as uh, artists and uh, uh, musicians, um, I think uh, there is uh, inherent uh, um, uh, racism and, and, and bias uh, 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 when you are American. I, 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 to be honest with you, I think uh, we we don't uh, analyze really what it means to be American sometimes. It's like we have this, the, the American dream, you know, the, the white picket fence. It's like, so it's a dream to keep people out, you know? And it, it's like, we need to uh, build, you know, bridges, you know what I mean? Um, rather than fences and walls. Um, and I think uh, once, once we do that, we we'll realize that coming together isn't, uh, isn't so bad. If anything, it, it's, it's what's going to, to save our planet. Um, and I, tr I truly believe that because if it, I, I would not have the, the sp we talk about the spiritual, I wouldn't have the spiritual in my hands if it wasn't for Ricordi and uh, uh, Antonin Dvorak. I wouldn't have it. So it, 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 we, need, we need each other, so. Wonderful, wonderful final word. I've got nothing more to say other than I admire you all enormously. I'm so grateful you came on the show. Thanks for so much time. It's been a wonderful conversation and so many tips of so many icebergs. Go compose some more gorgeous music and everybody tune in, listen, be aware, be tolerant, be alive, be now. <laughs> Good night. See you next week.